All right. All right, so my topic today is ketogenic diet, um, a call to individualized therapy. And here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant actually to the content, content that I will be covering today. And I wanted to start with a case. Um, I think it's always, you know, for clinicians, I think cases speak um, louder than multiple slides. So let me tell you Katie's story. And I have um, uh, permission from her family to tell that. So um, I first met Katie back in uh, February of, of 2008. She was three years of age at that time and had presented with a first brief generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, there were really no other risk factors. She was developmentally well and um, sort of reassured the family that, you know, likely this, this uh, hopefully was going to be just a single event and, and hopefully would not cause any problems long term. We did not start her on medication at that time. She went seizure free for, for two months and was well behaved, but then really um, uh, things exploded in April. So she had um, uh, generalized tonic-clonic and, and myoclonic seizures. These were occurring multiple, multiple per day, um, such that she was actually admitted to hospital. Um, she was uh, started on multiple different medications to try and get these under control. Um, both the seizures and medication likely contributed to significant lethargy. She was off balance. She, moms had, had lost her spark. She was really out of it. And we had tried her on three anti-seizure medications really with no significant benefit. Her EEG showed high amplitude diffuse slowing. She had frequent runs of generalized spike wave. And very, very shortly after her initial um, presentation with the, these multiple seizures, she was started on the ketogenic diet. Um, a month into the diet, she was seizure free, but mom said she was still really inattentive, disinhibited, not back to her normal self. Um, and she attributed that to medication. And certainly, um, you know, based on what we had seen when we had started medication and when we had started the diet, we were much more convinced the diet was efficacious as opposed to, uh, to the medication. Um, she was actually able to wean off her anti-seizure medications and uh, maintain seizure freedom with um, resumption of her usual engaging personality. And uh, here she is uh, whilst on the ketogenic diet, you can see she was doing very, very well. And she has continued to be seizure free and is now actually in the top of her class. So I think she uh, really illustrates quite nicely why we need to think about ketogenic diet in some of these um, uh, very challenging early life epilepsies and probably also in some adult epilepsies. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is first of all, what is a ketogenic diet? What do we mean by that term? Um, we'll, we'll look at a, a little bit of in, uh, data on why does it work, and I think the bottom line is nobody has a really clear answer on exactly why, um, but we know that it does, and, and we'll provide some evidence for that. We'll talk about um, the different types of diets um, and some of the pros and cons of each of those. Um, who are the best candidates for dietary therapy, and conversely, who are not good candidates for dietary therapy. What are the possible side effects that we need to, uh, to be looking for? And then finally, how do we initiate and monitor the diet? So what is a ketogenic diet? Well, the bottom line, it's, it's a high fat diet, low in carbohydrate. It does contain adequate protein, um, but it is less protein than most kids are used to. Um, and as uh, Rajesh had mentioned, this um, is now sort of 100 years old. It was developed at Mayo Clinic in 1921. And the story of the development is kind of interesting. So there were a number of osteopathic physicians uh, prior to that time who said that, you know, if you fast children with severe epilepsy, some of them will become seizure free. And so that seemed like a, you know, an effect effective treatment, but clearly not a long-term treatment. You can't fast children forever. And so this diet was actually um, designed to mimic the fasting state. And here is the uh, initial uh, publication of that that was now 100 years old. So what happens when you start um, uh, starvation? We see, um, first of all, a reduction in children in, in their liver glycogen. Um, we see increases in, in plasma uh, glucagon. We see uh, initially uh, stability of the blood glucose, and then that starts to fall as your liver glycogen is depleted. Uh, with that, you see elevated uh, plasma-free fatty acids. And then a little bit later, we see these elevation in ketone bodies. And so the bottom line is we are nourishing the brain with ketone bodies as opposed to with glucose. And so one of the big questions here is why does this work? And we know that there, and there have been lots and lots of work done on this, we know that there are several mechanisms. I think what we don't know is which is the most important mechanism, and is that the same for all, all patients? 
So certainly uh, ketones can stabilize nerve cells. We know that there are certain types of fatty acid that can also um, uh, affect seizure threshold and, um, and be potentially anticonvulsant. Um, we know that the ketogenic diet can affect certain neurotransmitters and those in turn um, seizure threshold. There's been uh, some interesting work, and I think uh, going to be more interesting work looking at the, the gut microbiome and, and assessing how that may impact seizure control. And then as well, um, and that was um, uh, looked at in, in a condition called febrile infection-related epilepsy syndrome, we know that the ketogenic diet also has anti-inflammatory effects and um, contributes to, to reduction of oxidative stress. So there's a number of different potential mechanisms so looking at um, uh, ketone bodies, um, the role of ketone bodies, the anticonvulsant role, I think is a bit controversial and, and not well established. So um, uh, in some studies, acetoacetate has been said to have anticonvulsant effects. That's not true in all studies. Beta hydroxybutyrate, which is typically the ketone that we measure for in the, um, in the serum um, of patients on the ketogenic diet does not seem to have anticonvulsant effects. Um, ketone bodies themselves can um, uh, result in opening of the ATP-dependent calcium, or sorry, potassium channels, and that actually leads to neuronal hyperpolarization. And as well, ketone bodies can inhibit vesicular glutamate uh, transport, so they can um, certainly have secondary effects on making the cells less excitable. Um, we know that when you are on the ketogenic diet, the brain metabolizes ketone bodies, not glucose. Um, and so there's less glucose transport through the brain capillary endothelial layer and reduced levels of glucose decrease GABA-A receptors at the synapses. So there's increased GABA-A receptors at the synapses, so increased inhibition. Chronic ketosis also is associated with increased mitochondrial biogenesis, so that hopefully will actually increase brain energy stores. Um, and that can also have secondary impact on the um, opening of those ATP-dependent potassium um, uh, channels, which hyperpolarize. And then looking at neurotransmitters, um, there's been uh, work showing that persons um, on the ketogenic diet have increased levels of GABA in the CSF. Um, also, um, uh, some evidence that the ketogenic diet increases levels of leucine. Leucine can block transamination of glutamate to aspartate, leading to lower aspartate levels. Um, uh, generally, um, aspartate would inhibit glutamate de um, decarboxylase, but if there's less aspartate, there's going to be more glutamate that is then converted to GABA, so increasing inhibition. Looking at the um, microbiome, um, this has been looked at fairly extensively in rodents, and I think the work in humans is still kind of evolving. Um, but we know that um, the ketogenic diet results in a decreased alpha diversity. Alpha diversity just means um, the number of different um, uh, organisms within the gut. Um, so normally there's a lot of bacteroids in, in the human gut. Um, uh, increased alpha diversity is if you have other uh, uh, um, biome species as well. And um, potentially then it, it increases um, bacteria that are considered more beneficial. Um, bacteria can actually, in the gut, can cause um, production of different metabolites. They can um, produce hormones. They can produce neurotransmitters or change neurotransmitters. They can affect how anti-seizure medications are, are absorbed. So I think there's a lot of reasons why this, this could be the case. Um, certainly, um, uh, this can result in changes in colonic luminal uh, metabolome with decreases in GABA glutamyl amino acid, and that can actually lead to increased GABA glutamate uh, uh, ratios in the brain. I think that looking at this, as I had mentioned, there is, a, I think, a reasonable evidence to suggest there may be this link in rodents. Um, uh, still, I think work is ongoing in humans. Um, there's not yet good evidence in humans that the gut microbiome is a good surrogate marker for treatment efficacy of a ketogenic diet. And then there's anti-inflammatory effects. Um, we do know that, um, you know, particularly in certain seizure conditions like febrile infection-related epilepsy, um, that seems to result in, in just uh, a wicked um, uh, uh, neuronal uh, inflammation, and that can beget more seizures. Um, and uh, interestingly, in that disorder, the ketogenic diet has been shown to be uh, beneficial. Um, the ketogenic diet reduces uh, peripheral and brain levels of inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-1 beta. And then as well, the um, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels that are elevated can result in transcription of, of genes, changes in transcription of genes that actually um, can protect the cells from oxidative stress. So the anti-inflammatory uh, component is also there. 
So clearly there are a number of different reasons on why the ketogenic diet may work. Um, and probably several of those um, mechanisms uh, play a role in, in many individuals. So first of all, um, so then moving on, so how do we know that it actually does work? And I think, you know, it's been used for many, many years as, as Rajesh says, it's now sort of the hundredth anniversary of the ketogenic diet use. Um, the first randomized control trial of the diet, however, was not published until 2008. And that was work out of the UK by Helen Cross and, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Neal. They um, had 145 children that they randomly assigned to start the ketogenic diet versus continue on their usual therapy. Um, so, um, you know, clearly placebo control is not going to be a good option here. Um, and after three months, children on the diet had significantly fewer seizures. And what they found was that responder rates so those who had achieved more than 50% reduction in seizures, 38% on the diet versus only 6% on their usual treatment. So that was the first um, uh, trial that really was a, a randomized control trial that confirmed that the ketogenic diet really did work. Um, the Cochrane Review, there's been a number of Cochrane Reviews um, on this topic, the most recent in 2018, and they looked at that point at 13 studies, um, nearly 1,000 participants, and about three quarters of those participants were, were pediatric. And what they found in children um, was that um, both seizure freedom as well as reduction in seizures was significantly more likely with the ketogenic diet than with the usual therapies. They found that with the classical diet, about 55% um, uh, or up to 55% achieved seizure freedom and up to 85% reduction in seizures. Um, the numbers on the modified Atkins were a little bit lower, but remember you're using the modified Atkins a little bit more commonly in older individuals who may also not respond quite as well to the diet as very young children. And then looking at the data in, um, in adults that was more limited, um, at that point, they had they had not they had said that there's no patient that has achieved seizure freedom, um, uh, but seizure reduction was more likely with the diet, and that was predominantly the modified Atkins diet. And 42% of patients had received uh, or had achieved reduction uh, on a modified Atkins diet if they were adults. There was another study that uh, came out of India and that looked at, this was a randomized control trial of the efficacy of the ketogenic diet. This was in children, one to five years of age, so young children. And they compared the traditional ketogenic diet, the modified Atkins diet and a low glycemic index diet. And these um, a large study, 170 kids that were randomized to one of these three diets in addition to their usual anti-seizure medications. There was a 24 week treatment period after which they were assessed. Um, they overall had a fairly high completion rate. So 158 of 170 kids completed the dietary therapy. And when they looked at, you know, um, did kids assigned to a specific diet drop out more commonly, they did not find that diet, the dropout rates were actually similar between the arms. And what they found um, was really no significant difference in um, response rates. So when they looked at median seizure reduction, 66% uh, on the traditional diet, 45% on the modified Atkins, and 54% on the low glycemic, but you can see those pretty wide ranges, and so significantly um, no difference between, between those groups. They did find um, that side effects were a little more common on those who were on the ketogenic diet and modified Atkins as opposed to the low glycemic. And then another um, uh, meta-analysis, this came out in Epilepsia Open in, in 2018, and this is looking at the use of the diet in adults. Um, they reviewed 16 studies, including a total of 338 adults. Um, uh, as expected, most of the uh, patients were on either a modified Atkins or low glycemic, as those are the diets typically used for adults. Um, and um, they found actually 13% of adults achieved seizure freedom. So that was a little different than what the Cochrane Review had, had found. Um, and they had over half of patients achieving a greater than 50% reduction. So clearly this is a, a therapy that can be also very effective uh, for adults with drug-resistant epilepsy. The most common side effects were weight loss and hyperlipidemia. Obviously hyperlipidemia is something that I think is a little more concerning in an adult. Um, uh, because of the cardiovascular uh, concerns than in a, a very young child. 
There's been a couple of randomized controlled trials that have been done in adults. The first um, by uh, Kavernland, uh, published in 2018. This was a relatively small study. So 28 adults randomized to a modified Atkins, 34 to a regular diet uh, for a 12 week treatment period. And they found really not significant difference in um, uh, a reduction in seizure frequency. Interestingly, if they looked at those who had a modest reduction in seizures, that number was a bit higher on the modified Atkins, but they did not overall find a significant change. Um, and then another study that came out of um, Hopkins, and they looked here at um, 80 adults. All of these adults got dietary therapy. Some of them got modified Atkins alone, and then some of them kind of got a, a, um, a higher dose of, of ketogenic, um, and that was a modified Atkins plus four to one uh, keto cal formula. So these people would have been on a higher ratio, higher dose ketogenic diet. And they found really that there was no significant difference in seizure control at one or, or two months. Um, uh, those patients um, that were in either group improved. In fact, half of patients on a modified Atkins alone versus 55% on the combination group um, achieved a greater than 50% reduction in seizures. And so what this says is that probably adults don't really benefit a whole lot from a much, much higher dose um, uh, diet and a modified Atkins or low glycemic seems reasonable. One of the other benefits that we can see in um, a person starting a ketogenic diet with drug-resistant epilepsy is, is many of these patients are on multiple um, uh, medications, often at high doses, and those medications often have you know, a pretty significant impact on, on quality of life and a lot of side effects. And this was a study, again, that came out of Hopkins, and they looked at, you know, what about medication reduction in people who are on the ketogenic diet? And what they found was that three quarters of patients were able to reduce medicine. They were actually able to drop the daily cost of medication by 70%, so pretty significant. Um, they had an overall decreased cost of overall care. The parents reported some improved alertness. I think that, you know, that's, I think, a, a tougher thing to measure accurately, but reports of improved alertness. And when they looked at when were patients able to reduce medication, over a third were able to reduce medications within the first month, and 90% were successful with that. So that's, I think, another benefit of the ketogenic diet, not only to get better seizure control, but also potentially lesser um, side effects. So there's a number of different types of ketogenic diet. Um, the one that was initially described, we termed the traditional or the classic ketogenic diet. This is the most strict form. Um, and you'll typically hear, you know, people talk about a two to one ratio or a four to one ratio. And what that ratio means is the grams of fat divided by the grams of protein and carbohydrate combined. Okay, so somebody who is on a four to one uh, for every um, uh, gram of protein and carbohydrate combined, they are taking in four grams of fat. So pretty high um, amount of fat. In fact, on a four to one diet, more than 90% of your calories are gonna be fat calories. Um, the traditional or classic diet um, is um, uh, a lot of work for most families. So they have to weigh out and, and measure all ingredients, typically on a gram scale. And the other thing is that the kids have to eat everything on their plate to make sure that that ratio stays consistent. The modified Atkins um, has been a sort of less strict form of a ketogenic diet and I think is increasing in use, particularly in older children, certainly in adolescents and, and adults. It is less strict. You don't have to weigh and measure everything, but you do need to count your carbohydrates. Um, most people will start a modified Atkins at about 10 grams of carb per day. And then if the patient is doing well, often at two to three months, you can actually liberalize those carbohydrates a bit, even getting up to 20 grams a day without worsening seizure control. And then also on a modified um, Atkins diet, fat is encouraged. So creams or oils are encouraged. The MCT diet, this is the medium chain triglyceride diet. This is used in a couple of centers. I know um, Sick Kids in Toronto uses this a lot. Um, this is also used um, in, in, uh, in London at U in the UK. Um, and sort of the thoughts behind this is medium chain triglycerides are actually more ketogenic per gram than long chain triglycerides, obviously because the, the, they're medium chain and not long chain. And therefore you can actually get more ketone per gram and so the diet could be potentially more palatable because you can then take in more non-fat calories. And so uh, the thoughts are that this actually is potentially a more palatable option um, and still allowing a, a pretty high um, uh, ratio. 
And then finally, the low glycemic index diet. This is um, described by the group in Boston, Elizabeth Teal and her colleagues. Um, this is least strict. Um, and it, with this diet, you're counting carbohydrates and you are using carbohydrates only with a, a low glycemic index. Uh, what that means is, is that your carbohydrate is not going to be rapidly broken down into glucose. So we're talking about, you know, carbohydrates and vegetables versus carbohydrates and chocolate cake. Um, and again, fats are, are encouraged. And then um, many patients are formula fed or tube fed. And the question is, can we actually do the diet in formula fed or tube fed people? And the answer is yes, and it's pretty easy. So there are commercially available, available formulas that are out there. KetoCal is an example of that or the dietitians often will make, make up their own mix of ROS carbohydrate-free, microlipid, and polycose. Um, this is super, super easy to give. Um, it's well-tolerated, it tastes pretty good, and it's not difficult. So I think for, um, for tube-fed patients, this is actually a, a really good option. Um, there's also been some work looking at uh, ketogenic TPN. Um, and that was uh, published by Vanderlau um, uh, last year in developmental medicine and child neurology. Um, and so um, this has been used for patients who are in the ICU with uh, acutely worsening seizure conditions. So people who have refractory status epilepticus um, or um, uh, febrile infection um, uh, related epilepsy syndrome, often again with refractory status epilepticus. Or in some cases, if you are on a ketogenic diet and you're temporarily NPO because you're post-op from something and you need a ketogenic diet. So um, potentially the ketogenic diet can be given in this form as well. Um, there have been now international consensus guidelines to, to help with that. Um, the recommendation or the, the requirement is that this is actually a temporary therapy. So um, while you can use this for a short time, you really want to start oral feeding as quickly as possible. Um, the recommendation is that this should be started in an ICU by an experienced ketogenic team. So you, you need somebody who understands the ketogenic diet, um, a clinician and a dietitian. Um, also the recognition that you typically can't get to high ratios. So many of our kids, we have them on a three to one or a four to one ratio. If you're using ketogenic TPN, usually you can get to maybe a one to one ratio, um, but you can't get much higher than that. Um, but the bottom line is the efficacy still is, is pretty good at that level. And then the last thing you want to remember is that these are critically ill people. Um, and so you really want to be sure that you're providing adequate protein and adequate calories for their, uh, for their needs. So this is just looking at um, the diet composition by the uh, percent of keto calories. So here is, you know, all of us who are on a normal diet, or most of us are on a normal diet. And you can see most of our diet is actually carbohydrate. We have a little piece of pie of, uh, of protein here, and then about a quarter of our calories are coming from fat. Um, for somebody who's on a four to one classic diet, you can see about 90% of their calories are now coming from fat. They have protein, but their protein is less than you would get, and just a really tiny sliver of carbohydrate. Um, here is somebody on the modified Atkins diet. Um, so we see a larger piece of the pie coming from protein. And so sometimes this is actually more tolerable, particularly in our older kids or adolescents who really like their protein. You're still getting a fair bit of calories from fat and you're getting a little bit more carbohydrate, but clearly less than you, you would normally get in a regular diet. And then the low glycemic index diet, um, again, um, uh, still getting a fair bit of fat your carbohydrate is more, but remember these are carbohydrates that are low glycemic index carbohydrates, so slowly broken down into glucose. So kind of, you know, when you're, when you're choosing what diet should you start, I think there's pros and cons to think about with, with all of those. And I just wanted to outline some of those. So looking at the, the classic or the, the traditional ketogenic diet, um, I think one of the pros is, is that um, there's not a lot of guesswork by families. So they know exactly how much of each food to give. In fact, they're given you know, um, uh, meal plans um, and recipes by the dietitian that says you give this many grams of egg and this many grams of cream and this many grams of oil. So you know exactly what it is that you're supposed to be giving. Um, there's also very li there's more uh, limited variation in ketones because you're getting that same ratio all the time. Um, if somebody is not achieving adequate ketosis, it's pretty easy for the dietitian to adjust because he or she knows exactly what the patient is, is getting. And the family doesn't, need, doesn't have to keep as many records. So they typically follow the recipes given by the dietitian, but they don't have to sort of chart everything down. 
the cons, and I think, you know, one of the, the big issues is that this is really difficult to adjust based on appetite. And we know that there are days when kids are more active and more hungry and other days when they're more sedentary and less hungry. Um, if you are, you know, making whatever it is you're making for supper recipe A from the dietitian, that is the same amount regardless of whether you've had a busy day or a not so busy day. And so you can't really adjust this very easily based on appetite. The kids do need to eat everything on their plate. And that usually means actually we supply them with a little spatula and they have to kind of, you know, um, scrape up all of the grease on their plate and get that in. There is a lot more weighing and measuring. This is certainly more time consuming for families. Some families get around that by, you know, picking one day and they make, you know, 20 recipes of a certain meal and put 19 in the freezer. So it, it's a little easier, but certainly if they have to do this with every meal, it's very time consuming. And there's also more stigma. So if you go to a restaurant or you're going, you know, somewhere for dinner, it's really hard to find something that you can eat. In fact, you can't, you have to bring your food with you. Looking at the Atkins, are they uh, are the modified Atkins or the low glycemic index diet? Um, I think the pros here is you can adjust for variations in appetites. You're counting carbs and you're given sort of guidelines for um, fat and for, for protein, but you can actually increase the amount if you need to. It does provide more protein and that's helpful for kids who like more proteins. Probably lower side effects because you're not running the same degree of ketosis. So, um, you know, less concerns for kidney stones, things like that. There's a lot less weighing and measuring. You're counting carbs, but that's about it. So it's faster meal preparation. And usually you can go to a restaurant and find something that you can eat that will not break your diet. So socially, if you're a teenager, that's a lot easier. If you go out with your friends, you're not bringing your lunch with you. Um, cons, so there's really more guidelines here as opposed to clear instructions. So there's no meal plans. Um, families are given some sort of, you know, broad goals by the dietitian, but um, uh, there's a little bit more guesswork for them. Um, and so families often need to experiment a little bit to determine what are adequate fats to achieve the, the degree of ketosis. And because um, uh, you know, you're not weighing and measuring everything, you can see a little bit more variability in ketone production or sometimes even negative urine ketones. That doesn't necessarily worsen seizure control though, but you, you can see that. So the next question is who is the best candidate or, or who, is, who should not be considered for the diet? Um, and I think here there's not sort of, you know, clear 100% indications for everyone. Um, I can give you some guidance here. So um, usually we think of the ketogenic diet as being more effective or most effective in infantile and childhood developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, but it can also be helpful for focal epilepsies and it can also be helpful for adults. One of the questions often comes up is, is there a particular seizure type that responds better? And this is data from a nice study that was done at Hopkins. Um, and you can see here um, all of the different seizure types and the response. And you can see here that there was benefit in all seizure types. I think what is um, maybe a little bit noticeable here is if you look at partial that we now call focal seizures, um, they did not have anybody with focal seizures who was in the seizure-free group, but they had lots of people with focal seizures, as you can see, who were 90 to 99% improved. So you can certainly improve with a focal epilepsy, maybe not um, becoming seizure-free. So um, looking at, at sort of the best candidates, as far as um, uh, entities that have been shown to be, you know, significantly beneficial in clinical studies, and this is um, a summary that um, uh, Dr. Kossoff put together with a number of international experts, and I'll, I'll give you a reference for that paper at the end. Um, but looking at specific epilepsy syndromes where it's been highly efficacious, um, infantile spasms, although I would say not first line, I think it's, it's important to use um, uh, hormonal therapy or bigabatrin first line, but certainly more refractory spasms, um, Dravet syndrome, um, myoclonic atonic epilepsy, uh, febrile infection related epilepsy, Otohara syndrome, and other cases of super refractory status epilepticus. There's a number of genetic and metabolic epilepsies where it's been shown to be very beneficial. And I think this is the treatment of choice for glucose transporter deficiency. And we really want to start the ketogenic diet as quickly as we can for those, those children. And probably also the treatment of choice for pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, but can also be helpful for other uh, genetic and metabolic epilepsies. 
has been shown to have moderate benefit for a number of other epilepsy syndromes, including um, uh, some of the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, as well as some of the um, DEEs, including uh, Lennox Gasto or um, epileptic encephalopathy with continuous spike wave and sleep. Um, again, some other genetic and metabolic epilepsies that um, has been shown modest benefit for, and then other things, including malformations of cortical development. And then similarly, there are kids that probably should not, or people that probably should not be started on, on the ketogenic diet. And so there are absolute contraindications. Remember, in order to uh, make this work, you need to be able to um, break down your fatty acids, turn them into ketone bodies. And so if you have a problem with carnitine, that's gonna make the diet um, not effective. And that could really put, you at, put your patient at significant risk of metabolic compromise. Um, persons with um, uh, disorders of fatty acid oxidation should not be treated with the diet. Um, MCAD, LCAD, or SCAD. Um, pyruvate carboxylase deficiency, again, um, you could, um, uh, if starting them on a high fat diet would be uh, uh, putting them at a very high risk of metabolic compromise um, and uh, porphyria. And then relative contraindications, um, you know, one of the questions often comes up, you know, is this a reasonable option for somebody who has a surgical focus? And I would say that if you have a, a surgical focus, you have a pretty high likelihood of seizure freedom after your surgery and a pretty low likelihood of deficit, then um, certainly going forward with an epilepsy surgery procedure is, is much, much more likely to render you seizure free than ketogenic diet. Um, but you know, if, if you have a family who is you know, really wanting to try the diet first, I think it's not inappropriate to, uh, to look at that. Um, other things would be um, the use of propofol, um, uh, poor parental compliance, um, poor nutritional status, Patients who are, are high aspiration risk and are orally fed, remember this is a diet that's very high in fat, so you don't wanna fill the lungs up with, uh, with lipid. And then um, those with significant hyperlipidemia, um, uh, that would be a relative contraindication. So just going through some of the um, uh, epilepsy syndromes. So for West syndrome or infantile spasms, um, uh, Dr. Kossoff and his group at Hopkins looked at uh, children with uh, spasms and found that 62% were spasm-free after a month. This was retrospective, and this was looking at kids who started um, uh, the ketogenic diet as first therapy for spasms, but this, I would say, was um, not as good as what they saw with hormonal therapy. So again, I, I would have concerns personally about starting a child with West syndrome on ketogenic diet first line without looking through uh, or without uh, uh, looking at a, a first line um, therapy, either hormonal or vigabatrin. For other severe generalized epilepsies, so for Lennox Gasto, um, one study reported about a 30% uh, seizure freedom or near seizure freedom at 12 months. Um, I'm not sure I have anybody with Lennox Gesto who has become seizure free, but I think it can be very beneficial for them. Um, myoclonic atonic epilepsy of Deuce. Um, Here is, I think this is, this is probably the most effective therapy for this syndrome. Um, uh, Linda Locks out of Chicago, and then my colleague, Kate Nichols, um, uh, working together with Sharita Joshi, another Canadian who is now in, in um, uh, Denver, and then Eric Kossoff looked at this just recently and published that in Epilepsia and found 70% have a marked reduction in seizures and a pretty high number actually became seizure free. So I think for, for that particular entity, um, if I had a child myself with this condition, I would put them on ketogenic diet as quickly as I could. Um, for Dravet syndrome, about two-thirds of patients have a greater than 50% reduction, about 10% achieve near seizure freedom. And then tuberous sclerosis, another study from, um, from Hopkins reported that 90% had a greater than 50% reduction in seizures, half had a greater than 90% reduction in seizures, so certainly could be used for that condition as well. So looking at um, potential side effects, any therapy obviously has side effects. And, and I think it's important to communicate to the family that just because this is a diet, it doesn't mean that there are no side effects. This side effects need to be monitored. Um, early on, what we often will see are issues potentially with food refusal. If we have a, you know, a very um, defiant uh, little toddler who is used to getting their own way, sometimes it can be a little challenging to start them on the diet. Um, in young kids, particularly if they are not taking in calories or they are actually vomiting with their, their ketogenic diet, they can drop their blood sugars pretty quickly. Um, 
uh, vomiting on the ketogenic diet if they are not tolerating that or if they are excessively ketotic. And then um, uh, some of these metabolic decompensations. So if you have one of these rare metabolic conditions like a disorder of fatty acid oxidation or a carnitine deficiency, and you put somebody on the ketogenic diet, you can really make them metabolically unstable. So that, that should be screened for before. Um, looking at um, a study that, that came out of Hopkins, looking at 158 kids who were admitted for a classic ketogenic diet initiation and how do they tolerate that. So one thing that Hopkins does a little bit different than most places is um, uh, fasting. I think most of the centers now are no longer fasting. Um, but 80% of kids in this, set, in this study were fasted for 18 hours at onset, and all of them had calories, at least in part, restricted on day one. Um, and they had 80% with side effects that they had about a third of kids developing uh, vomiting. They had a pretty high rate of hypoglycemia. And again, I think that likely relates to the fact that they fasted because certainly in, in my experience, we do not fast and we do not have that, um, that rate. And then about a 4% of kids became excessively ketotic. And that can be a problem because then they, they throw up, they don't wanna eat. Um, and so in that situation, usually you need to give them a little bit of orange juice. And they found that younger children were more likely to develop repeated hypoglycemia. So I think certainly for younger children, fasting can be quite dangerous. Um, longer term side effects, um, constipation is probably the biggest one that we see, very manageable with Marilax, but, but pretty common. Um, many of these kids, they're already ketotic. And so if, if they get an acute illness and that you know, has a negative impact on their appetite, they can get excessively ketotic pretty quickly so they can get dehydration and vomiting. Um, High cholesterol can be an issue, and many of our kids have sort of borderline high cholesterol. I think the clock starts ticking a little bit more if you're, you know, post-pubertal and your cholesterol is higher. Um, kidney stones, um, slower growth can be a concern, and these kids need to be followed carefully by, um, by a dietitian with expertise in this area to make sure they're getting adequate calories. Some of the kids can also have some increased blu bruising and infection. Um, the other important thing is to recognize, um, uh, unless you're using a ketogenic formula, that this is um, a diet that does require supplementation with B vitamins and calcium. Um, so you do need to have um, those supplements. That's a must and not a, not a wish. Um, and then very rarely cardiomyopathy and pancreatitis can occur. But I think the bottom line is these are, are generally preventable by appropriate screening. They're easily managed by minor adjustments in the diet. So starting the diet, um, a pre-diet visit, I think is, is really essential uh, for both the dietitian and the neurologist. For the neurologist, you really need to confirm um, you know, to, th what type of epilepsy this is and confirm this is the best treatment. You need to exclude contraindications. Um, you need to look for any issues with feeding. You know, is this patient a high aspiration risk? Do they have specific food um, likes or dislikes? Um, and then I think together with your dietitian, select which dietary option would be best for this child and family. Um, when you're seeing these patients, a lot of these kids, as I said, are on multiple medications. And so you need to look at those medications and try and convert those medications to low carb or no carb formulations. And I typically do that before um, uh, they start the diet so they get used to that. Um, you wanna educate the family on the diet and address any psychosocial issues in the implement in the implementation, make sure the family is on board. I think grandparents sometimes can be challenging because they, uh, you know, they, they're used to spoiling their grandkids, but I think they cannot do that with food anymore. And then um, discussing the need for calcium and vitamin supplementation and, and, and why that is necessary. We also get some baseline labs, um, and this is really to exclude any type of contraindicated um, inborn error. I typically will get an acyl carnitine level, organic acids, and a lactate. Um, other labs that, that commonly I consider would be a fasting lipid panel, certainly in an older individual. I think any adult or adolescent, you'd want to do that, um, or if there's a family history of, uh, of hyperlipidemia. Um, checking electrolytes, liver enzymes, urine, just making sure there's nothing predisposing towards kidney stones. Um, and then, you know, you can certainly look for vitamin D and anti-seizure medication levels as well. So when you start the diet, usually um, uh, diet, if you're starting a modified Atkins or low glycemic, that's an outpatient initiation of the diet. Um, so they start the diet. I think what's really important is they have very close um, uh, contact with the dietitian as that's going so they can troubleshoot early. Um, if you're looking at a classical ketogenic diet or an MCT, that can be started either in or outpatient. 
Um, if you have an infant, a very young infant, you have somebody who has a history of poor oral intake, or you're going to, you, you have a pretty high suspicion that, you know, this is going to be a very challenging um, child and, and they're not going to be taking that diet very easily. Or if there's other risk factors for hypoglycemia or social concerns, then typically we would do an inpatient. Um, but for most people um, beyond infancy, outpatient initiation is an option. But again, you need access to your keto team. And the family also needs to be in reasonable proximity to medical care if suddenly the child is not taking medication or starts to vomit. Um, most centers now do not fast or do not and do not limit calories. Usually they start at full calories. Um, depending on, on how you start, if you're in hospital, we start a little bit more aggressively, usually starting at a two to one ratio. Um, if you're starting as an outpatient, we typically would start at a one to one ratio and go a bit slower. Ketone testing, if you're on the classic diet, um, we do check ketones um, with each void during the initiation of the diet. Once you're on the diet, um, you can decrease the amount or the frequency that you're checking your ketones. Um, I have some patients who are now on the diet for over a year and they may check them a couple times a week. Um, in infants, uh, urine ketones may not be as reliable. So sometimes you need to do beta hydroxybutyrate levels. Um, and really the aim is to get the kid into modest ketosis. And then you wanna fine tune over the next few weeks. Um, I think if you have them in hospital and you're shooting to get them to large ketosis, then they go home and they're more active. I think sometimes they can bounce. Um, again, you're wanting to make sure they're getting adequate protein intake and that's really working with your dietitian. Um, and that can be a little challenge in very um, small children, particularly those who are not very physically active. Um, and you may not be able to get them to a four to one ratio because you can't give them enough protein. You can't get their RDA for protein. So follow up, um, again, your keto team. This is very much a team effort. Um, I rely very much on my dietitian. So I think it's, it's you know, certain things that they, they need to follow and that I need to follow. And so typically we see them together um, uh, initially at one month after starting the diet for the first year, about every three months, and then thereafter anywhere from every three to six months. Um, during those visits, we assess their growth, we assess compliance with their diet and vitamin supplements. Um, and many of them do require, uh, as I said, uh, vitamin, uh, calcium, vitamin D, um, citrate. Uh, some centers actually start all patients on, on citrate to reduce the risk of kidney stones. Um, I think if you don't do that, you want to make sure that you're, you're checking urine um, and, and um, making sure that there's no evidence of increased calcium creatinine and also no evidence of, uh, of crystals. Um, many patients uh, also will have um, uh, be started on, on Miralax. And then we do check sort of trace metals, particularly selenium, if that's low, there's a thought that that can increase the risk of cardiomyopathy um, and maybe carnitine, depending on how things go. Um, assessing ketosis, you wanna tweak the diet as needed for seizure control. Even if you're in low to moderate ketosis, if your seizures are controlled, that's great, you can leave them there. Um, and then assessing for side effects and reviewing labs. Um, as far as follow-up, the labs that are typically done are listed here. And I said, as I said, those typically are done sort of a month after starting for the first year, every three months, and then after that, every three to six months. And they do need to be fasting. As far as discontinuing the diet. So, you know, one of the reasons we might discontinue the diet is if we don't think it's been effective. And I think that, you know, what I usually tell the parents, if you achieve good ketosis and you've been on the ketogenic diet for a month and you've not seen anything, the likelihood you're going to get further benefit is pretty low. Um, if you are still running low ketones, then potentially you can tweak the diet, okay? But I think certainly if you've been on the, on the ketogenic diet for one to three months in good ketosis and it hasn't worked, it probably is not going to work. Um, if benefit is seen, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, how long do we do this for? Um, we often consider tapering the diet at two years. Um, sometimes we will plan to taper the person to a less stringent diet. So if they've been on a traditional, maybe we taper them to a modified Atkins or a low glycemic. But here, I think you also want to consider the etiology and the syndrome. Obviously, somebody who had a glucose transporter deficiency, you're not going to do that. And then if you're discontinuing, um, how do you do that? And it's simple, just, just like medication, you would slowly taper um, over one to three months. And usually we do that by reducing the ratio. So if you're on a three to one ratio, you would go to 2.75 for a couple of weeks and then 2.5 for a couple of weeks and so on. And usually once you get to 
somewhere between a one to one and a two to one ratio. Um, check the ketones. If the ketones are really marginal at that point, you can usually step off the diet. So to summarize, I think it's a viable option in persons with medically intractable epilepsy. And I do not think it should be used only as a last resort. I think these patients can significantly benefit. Um, about half of patients will have a significant reduction in seizures. Nearly a third will have a marked reduction, more than 90%. It does require careful medical supervision by a team. So you need your dietitian and you need your physician. It requires faithful, faithful adherence um, by the family. So you can't be on the diet most of the time and not on it some of the time, because that will lead to breakthrough seizures. Um, there are clearly less strict forms that are better options for teens and adults and probably some older kids as well. Um, and uh, here is kind of looking at uh, a number of different foods. Um, resources and further information. So the Charlie Foundation or Matthew's Friends in the UK are really good um, uh, uh, sites for families to go to to get a bit more information on the ketogenic diet. And then uh, this was uh, the most recent version of the um, uh, international consensus um, on use of a ketogenic diet published in Epilepsia Open in 2018. So that's also a, a good resource to go to. And that is my talk. <laughs> but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. You may want to unshare your screen, Dr. Will. Thank you so much. That was a great talk, uh, very crisp and clear. Um, very clear that you have been doing this for a long time. Uh, so I am happy to uh, read some questions, but before that, I have uh, a few questions sure. just for, for my own my own learning. So modified Atkins say we have 20 gram carbohydrate. Low glycemic index therapy, you have 55 to 60 gram carbohydrate. The difference is we say in low glycemic index diet, the glycemic index is less than 55. But even in modified Atkins diet, what Whatever 20 gram you use, it is not going to be sugar. Right. They are off probably a low, lower glycemic index diet. So the point I am trying to make is, to me, it looks more or less similar. The term is different. I, I really do understand that people really want to keep names different. But to me, it is the level of carbohydrate is different. So what I'm saying, why not uh, a child can conceivably have seizure control at 40 gram carbohydrate? Because this magic number of uh, 10 or 20, irrespective of the age for a three-year-old versus a 16-year-old, uh, to me, sounds a bit arbitrary. What, what is your take on that? Yeah, so I think, you know, when you look at the modified Atkins, I think there is a couple things that are different. So lower carbs and, um, and you're right, you don't want to use, you know, mainstream sugar, right? You don't want to give them IV glucose for that, uh, for their 20 grams. But um, they also are taking in more fat generally than the, the low glycemic. So the low glycemic is, is generally less fat and it's really focusing on those carbs that are low glycemic. I think they're, you're, they're probably along a little bit of a spectrum. I know they have different names. Um, and I think that, you know, is it, reasonable if you have somebody on a modified Atkins and they're doing well at 20 and they're really, you know, the seizure control is good, but they're not doing very well from a, you know, I really want more carbs in my diet. Um, you know, can you try bumping up a bit? You probably could. You probably could. I think you have to individualize to your patients or maybe you move them to a low glycemic index diet to make it a little bit easier. Okay. Yeah. So similarly, rather than starting modified Atkins diet straight uh, away on 10 gram, uh, can some patients be started on a higher carbohydrate and then as we increase the ratio, can, uh, similarly, can we just reduce the carbohydrate and see what is the sweet spot? Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's an interesting question. There was one study that actually compared that and found that you were more successful if you started low and then you eased up afterwards than if you started high and you eased up later. So I typically, you know, start low and then ease up if they're successful. Okay, thank you. Um, so similarly with the modified Atkins diet, you can always individualize and combine maybe a bit of NCT, right? Depending upon your need. Can you mix and match so, a bit? Yeah, we, yeah. we sometimes use MCT, you know, even in kids on the traditional diet. Um, where you know we are really they're not their ketones are not where where they need to be but we're kind of stuck because we can't 
you know, increase the ratio anymore because of the protein requirements. And sometimes we'll use a little bit of MCT in that. So, you know, can you, sometimes I think, yeah, you can be creative and you can use a little bit of MCT if you need to. Again, you know, with your dietitian. Uh, do you arbitrarily increase to three to one ratio or four to one ratio, or you start at the two to one ratio and then see what the response is for classic diet? Yeah, we start at two to one and some kids are just little okay. keto machines, right? So some kids even at a two to one ratio are making really good ketones. And I think for those, anytime you make super good ketones on a low ratio, I kind of wonder, are you getting adequate calories? Because the other reason you can make ketones is if people aren't giving you enough calories, but you know, if you're growing and you're on a two to one and you're making, you know, even if you're not making such high um, uh, ketones, I think if your seizures are controlled, that's the bottom line. That's why we're using this is to get your seizures controlled. Okay, so let us go to some questions. Sure. Uh, this is um, another Elaine from uh, Halifax. We monitor urine ketones regularly when starting the diet and with outpatient monitoring. Some other centers uh, use monitoring the blood ketone. What are your thoughts, urine versus blood? Yeah, so I think that from my standpoint, kids hate getting poked. Um, and so I will do what I think I can do and get good information on without poking them. Um, so I think that um, that urine is, is reasonable for most kids. I think that, um, you know, there are some concerns that for infants less than 12 months, they, they the ketones in the urine may not be as accurate. And so for those, um, I think, think about um, if, if you are, are concerned that, that your urine is not accurate, then I think blood ketones is probably the way to go for, for infants. But I think for most kids, um, I, I would go urine. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the same person is, uh, even if they are on um, uh, recommended elements of zinc and selenium, when they are on classic diet, they see on blood work low zinc and selenium. Uh, is it your experience too? So um, we monitor selenium and if the selenium is low, we actually give them a selenium supplement. And that's, you know, and our dietitian calculates um, the recommended daily allowance. But I think if their selenium is low, we supplement them because of the concern for cardiomyopathy. Okay. And another one is uh, from uh, Quebec. Uh, the question is, in uh, glucose transporter one deficiency, we traditionally say it is a lifelong ketogenic diet, but is it really lifelong? Or at some point you can say, you know what, the brain has actually grown, the symptoms are minimal, that you can be the person of uh, ketogenic diet. Yeah, that's a, a good question. So there was a publication um, that came out in Epilepsy Open, I think, in the last year that uh, sort of a, an international consensus on, on that. I think that you know certainly in um, in younger ch or in children, um, higher ketosis is is going to be important just because of you know of, of the developing brain. Um, I would be uncomfortable stopping somebody on with that diagnosis completely. Um, you know, might you be able to think about converting them to uh, a more modest form of ketogenic diet when they get older? That's probably the approach that I would that I would do. I would probably look at. Um, a traditional keto though when they're young, but just because we know that that that's a you know that's a genetic condition that doesn't go away, um, and it, failing to treat them appropriately and nourish their brain appropriately is going to lead to potential cognitive issues. I would feel a little anxious trying to bring them off altogether. Okay, and Dr. Elizabeth Donner from Hospital for Sick Children, she's asking, uh, what do you think about the role of oral ketone supplements, which are becoming available now? That's a good question. I think those are exciting. Um, I think we need uh, a little bit. Um, I, I think we need more data and more studies to really know. I'd be interested in her thoughts if she has uh, any thoughts on that too. Because <laughs> I know she has okay. a, lot of, a lot of experience with the diet. Okay. Uh, from Ivan from um, Boston, um, what is the place of ketogenic diet in super refractory status epilepticus? Uh, when do you start it? What criteria do you use to monitor response? How long would you expect it to start working? Um, probably how early it starts working and how long until you consider it not working? Very practical question we always come across. Yeah, so I think it is a, a reasonable option in super refractory status. Um, I think particularly for 
for, um, you know, I think for, for kids where we're suspecting that this is febrile infection related epilepsy syndrome, um, I would move to that pretty quickly just because of the potential anti-inflammatory role there. Um, I think you, you know, so, so certainly you can move to that fairly quickly. I think you really though need your team. Um, and one of the challenges in the, in the ICU is they're getting so many medications and so many infusions. And so how to get them actually, you know, ketotic and how to get rid of the glucose and all of those infusions. I think you really need a, a keto team and a keto dietitian who's comfortable with that. Um, I think if you do get reasonable ketosis and you've, you know, super refractory status, if you've had, you know, reasonable ketosis for, geez, I don't know, I, I would say like a week or two and you've not had benefit, then probably it's not going to work, but that certain, certainly wouldn't stop me from doing other things in the meantime either. Okay, now let us go actually, to... I think there's actually a study going on looking at, um, at the use of that in adults. Okay, uh, let us go, go to Iran, uh, Dr. Vesa uh, Badvi. Um, he's asking, uh, how long would you continue ketogenic diet uh, in do syndrome? And I believe the child who responded very well. Yeah, so I think, you know, when you look at how long you continue, I think you look at the natural history of these syndromes, right? And so I don't think we really know what, you know, what causes do syndrome, but I think what we do recognize is that there's probably two groups. There's the group that's going to be super refractory and then the group that's going to respond really well. Um, I think in the group that responds really well, um, in most cases, we have been successful tapering after a couple of years of seizure freedom. Um, so that's probably what I would suggest that we do. Um, the kid that I, um, I presented was, was a deuce syndrome actually. And what we did with her is we tapered her onto, so she was on a traditional, she went to a, a low glycemic index for, for a year and then came off that way. So, and that was, I think the family was just super anxious to, to completely bring her off. But most of the kids that I've seen with deuce syndrome who respond nicely to the diet and, and generally they respond very quickly, um, usually after two years of treatment, you can try and bring them off typically by five or six years of age. I like to do that ideally before starting school because ketogenic diet is also a little bit more impactful in school. Another question, um, hmm, interesting. What is the optimal value of beta hydroxybutyrate? Whatever controls the seizures. So uh, I, like I don't, yeah, if that goes much above in our, I don't know if you guys, I can't remember actually if you guys have the same, uh, but we, we typically, ours runs from about, you know, three to 5.5. If it goes above 5.5, then we worry that that's too high. If it's less than three and they're seizure free, I'm not going to adjust the diet. I think that's great. Okay. Um, well, another one is from Dr. Rechna Deshai from Calgary. Uh, what are your thoughts on using low glycemic index treatment uh, therapy for a child with a, a glutamine disorder when they are unable to comply with the classic ketogenic diet? Yeah, so I think that, you know, that was looked at by the international uh, group as well. Um, that was that I think they just published their stuff, I want to say 2019 or 2020. Um, I think that most of us feel that probably they need a higher dose ketones. I think you're a bit stuck if they can't comply. And then do you know, do you put a feeding tube in them to, to get them uh, get adequate uh, uh, feeding in? I think, you know, this is something that I think has a pretty significant potential impact on development. So I would work really hard actually to get a higher dose ketone um, formula in those kids. Yeah. So then I have a question there because we have a lot of patients with a glucose transporter deficiency. Suppose uh, in some, the seizures are maybe very rare. Their issue may be some cognitive challenge and ataxia. So what is the ideal ketone level in those cases where I don't have any parameter to monitor? Yeah, if they're kids, boy, I like to run them on the higher. I like their ketones to be above 3.5 um, for me, just because I think of the impact on, on development. And we know that... Um, that's going to be a tougher thing to measure. I have, you know, a couple of kids who have really infrequent seizures and it's predominantly a developmental issue, um, but I still run those kids on the higher end when they're young. But if, this, if they have frequent seizures and if the seizures are controlled at a lower ketone level, would you be okay with that ketone level? Uh, for the, for GLUT1, I typically would want them above 3.5 beta-hydroxy. Okay. 
So thank you so much. We are, we are on the dot. It is one o'clock and thank you everyone uh, from around the world. Um, and thank you, Dr. Virel, for this great talk and your time and the discussion. And uh, next month, um, we will have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Donner talking on SUDAP. Thank you so much and enjoy the weekend.